What's going on, everybody? Brent Abel here, webtennis.com. And uh, jumping on this live, scheduled live, live scheduled. I'm not sure which one comes first anyway. We're about nine minutes early. Oh, maybe about seven minutes early. Anyway, just uh, again, trying to find the right platform for doing the live streaming. And uh, so uh, there we have the great Jeff Jacklich, otherwise known as Merlin. <laughs> you know, what the heck? I don't know. I, I assume what the heck. Yeah. Um, uh, guys, let's see what I'm trying to do here. Where are you today? Horribly misspelled. All right. <laughs> Boy, one, two, three, four, five words. I, I couldn't get through five words without, you know, the old charcuterie. Is that what it's called? The butcher charcuterie. job. Charcuterie, yes. Thank you. Yes. Now spell, you. spell Gruyere cheese for me, okay? <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. That's right. So, guys, we've got a few few early birds on here. Guys, uh, would love to know where you are today. Go ahead and, uh, you know, and I'll, uh, I'm still a little confused on the Facebook um, comment thing. Just it's above my pay grade, I guess. <laughs> like, you know, I. <laughs> and, if, and if we can't hear you, just type louder. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, what's up, Lynn? Maryland. Woo. Yeah, yeah. Rough country. How's the weather? Yeah. In Maryland? What's going on there today? Is it snowy? Is it clear? Is it beautiful? What's going on? Yeah. Yeah, no, I guess it's like, uh, I can't post to Facebook. All right, that's fine. Whatever. Be a little weird, Facebook. What's that guy, Zucker? Zuckerman, Zuckerberg, Zucker. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm in the same, you know, I guess I need to be silenced over there because yeah. I'm so controversial. Yes. Right. Sun is shining in Maryland. Nice. Yeah. Well, We're a little, uh, I'm here in Modesto and we got a little, a uh, little marine layer this morning. Not heavy, just, just light. But Lynn, Lynn, Lynn does not like Facebook. Yeah, well, I would say get in line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because everybody's uh, looking for the workaround on that one now. Oh God. It's brutal. It's brutal. Uh, but Lynn, listen, I'm glad you're over at YouTube. Uh, I guess you can hear us okay, obviously, and um, all that good stuff. What time we got here, Jeff? We got about three minutes before the appointed hour. Yeah, what, what are we going to talk about today anyway? This is kind of a, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've got the prompt up for you. Yeah, well. See this list? Oh, oh no. Headlines. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, I, I've got to actually be out of here by. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, guys, if you're. If you can, Kevin Wiley. Ahead and, yeah, Kevin Wiley with us. Um, let us know where you are today. Again, we're kind of tinkering around with different platforms of how to make it easiest for you to hang out with us on these live. I kind of like doing the live thing, Jeff. I mean, we went through 365 days back in 2019, a little bit of 2020 going, I mean, recording, not going yeah. live. But I think the live thing is... Uh, yeah, it's cool. It's a, a lot cooler. Now, there is there is someone there on Facebook. Yeah. Senor Soros is on Facebook, but I can see his, I can see his comment. I just can't respond to it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, can you see, can you see Senor Soros' uh, yeah, comment there, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I just can't, I can't reply to it, you know. 
I don't think I can reply to it. Well, here we go. Let's try this. Hola. Hola, Senor Soros. See if it goes to him or not. Senor Soros. You even type bilingually. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> well, whether he saw it or whether or not he can see it remains to be remains to be seen. How are we doing on time here, man? We got another couple of minutes. Dan, uh, Danny, how's it going out there in uh, Michigan? Yeah. So, what are we going to promote today? We're going to prom are we going to pitch anything today, Jeff? We got anything to sell? Is it uh, all just is it all just come, content? We're just instruction. We're going to give away heavy content, and I mean, doesn't that go against the the rule of online tennis professionals? Is yeah, everything basically is kind of a a prep for a good a good pitch. Yeah, I think the pitch today is going to be come see us personally. <laughs> And, we, and we'll be able to go, like, we'll get so much more work done than sending you a video. I mean, good. good. I think that's the deal is, is really, you want to get some work done. Come, come, let's do it in person and, and, you know, get in there and really it's just root around. Just, it's, <laughs> hey, it might be like a, a dentist with the, the root oh, yeah. now. Yeah, yes. well, when I come out to the court now, I wear the full, you know, bunny suit, the mask, the whole thing. I just get in there and you know, rip and really tear. Really work it around. Yeah, Pull good. stuff out, man. I see. Well, man, man, Fisher, wet and rainy. So no grass court tennis today, I guess. <laughs> I don't know why that's a laughing matter. I'm sure he doesn't think it's too humorous. Yeah. Well, Dan, just to, to really, you know, rub it in, right? Uh, that I was I was in Palm Springs with with Brent uh, this last weekend, and the grass was phenomenal. <laughs> well, let's put it this way: I, I got down. Let's see, I got here from Colorado uh, Monday a week ago, so I've been here what 10, 11 days. Haven't missed a day in the grass, Jeff. <laughs> Gosh darn it! Gosh darn it! Yes, yeah, you think that's funny. All right, look, I got a, I got a minute after nine o'clock. Um, we got a few folks lined up. Let's not waste anyone's time. Let's get to it, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, guys, listen, thanks for hanging out with us again today. And um, again, a new platform for me, which is uh, StreamYard. And we're trying to stream this thing out to YouTube and Facebook as well. If it works great, we'll keep doing it. If not, I'm going to go back to Zoom. I did figure out how to... Uh, uh, live stream from Zoom, which could make this really right. dangerous. So um, anyway, guys, thanks for hanging out with us. And as you can see, I got my cohort, hope my, my cohort here, Jeff Jacklich. I don't know. This could be just a little chuckle fest all day. Yeah, it could, it could be. be. Wingman. Yeah. Okay. Um, but as you can see, and if you've read the promo emails and the stuff we put on Facebook and, and YouTube, you know, today we're to talk about when your forehand is a wall, you know, what's, what's the workaround and it could be your forehand, could be your backhand, could be serve, could be anything. Could be, um, anything. Could be your, could be your noggin is a wall, right. which probably happens more, more often than, well, you know, any, anytime something, you know, starts to, you know, go down the rabbit hole, you know, your brain obviously is searching and searching. And so it, there's, you can't, you can't physically go off the rails without mentally taking a little side trip with it, you know, and, and that's where the rubber meets the road, really getting yourself back. Um, well, so look, why don't you let us in on, look, for, and, and again, congratulations. You won the Las Vegas sixties, beat a couple of really good guys there. Uh, the singles a couple of weeks ago, which is your second tournament win in recent months yeah and back to back yeah oakland about four weeks ago and then just yeah. last week um you know i came down to the desert on friday played the final in the morning and then um jumped in the car and headed to the grass baby yeah 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 <laughs> well so so let's go ahead and um tell tell us the story because i think the way you were telling me the other day is in the finals as you said uh the forehand was a little lost in the slot yeah, didn't really, it didn't really show up in the beginning. I mean, look, I mean, 
part of it shows up. It's not like, you know, it's an yeah, out-of-body like, experience you know, and all of a sudden. When something goes nutty, you know, it's, you know, something kind of goes off the rails. It's not necessarily, it's not, that, that doesn't mean that like every forehand I hit wasn't, you know, wasn't a decent ball or even, you know, to my, to my standard of hitting my forehand and everybody understands where their level of forehand is basically. Um, you know, I was probably running, I, I mean, I could still hit the basic rally ball and, and, you know, push that a little bit, but basically when I wanted to pull the trigger after, you know, hitting patterns and setting up the finish, um, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't keep the ball in the court. And there, and there, you know, the other, the other factor there with that is that uh, in Vegas, we're at 2000 feet. So the ball's carrying a little bit, it, it, it carries a little bit. So that was, that's part of it. But um, um, just leading into the tournament though, um, you know, I wasn't striking my forehand um, where I, you know, where I expect it to be. Um, and so you've got to, you know, you've got to like corral yourself and you, you can't, um, you, you can't just keep beating the drum, you know, and expect something by the, by the end of the match. Gosh, I hope this turns around um, be, because you're, what you're doing is you're speeding up the end of the match coming toward you. Um, and we've talked about this before, Brenny, that, that you, you've got to figure out when things aren't going perfect or they're not going, you know, like my forehand being, being just, just off the rails a little bit. I, I can't rush the end of the match. I can't, but, I, but, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to do something that makes the end of the match a little farther away. And I know that might may sound a little counterintuitive, but what that means is, is I'm going to have to hit an extra ball or two per point, possibly, um, to get to the finish uh, of those points. Well, look, I mean, you've got enough experience that this is not the first time it's ever happened to you, and yeah. and so. You know, you don't go through what I think a lot of players do is all of a sudden the forehand doesn't feel right on that day, whether it's in the warm up, whether it's in the first few games of the match or whatever, but it just doesn't feel the way you want it to feel. And I think a lot of players go through, well, what's my technique checklist that I got to make sure I'm, I'm, you know, checking off all the different boxes in terms of, you know, spacing, in terms of setup, whatever right. it is. I think that there's, there's, uh, a mistake that players make in that they don't trust. And I know that you, you, you recognize, okay, all right. It's okay. Not hitting it the cleanly hundred percent the way I want, but in the same time, I don't have to, Oh God, let me make sure that I've got my little checklist here right. and, and go through everything and, and think to yourself, there's a chance that I might not be able to hit a decent forehand today where, where you're probably going, all right, like it's slightly off. It's okay until it comes back. Right. I'm going to trust that. First of all, I'm going to trust that it, it it's not totally gone. It's not an out of body experience. No, no. And, and the, you know, like what you're getting at there is, is that the, the process of, of deciding that um, it first, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Um, two is you, it's very, very difficult to, to manually process the, 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 your sequence while trying to play a match. I mean, you're, you're, you're asking right side, left side of your brain to do things simultaneously in a, in a, in a, in a, in a discipline that is requiring you to be, um, creative and, present tense and you have to take in just a boatload of information and process it and respond. Um, so it's much like, uh, it's a, it's a basic analogy, but when you drive your car, um, that's the creative side of your brain that's working. Actually, you're not manually processing. Oh, I see a ball coming into the street. I see a kid on his bike. I see, uh, you know, elderly person with a walker coming in the side. You're not, you're not manually processing all that information. You're, you're processing it. What is it? Right side of the brain. Um, the creative side. Okay. So you're processing, you're filtering all that information through present tense and you're just responding to it naturally. Right. So in a tennis match, um, when something like this goes off the rails, you, the last thing you want to do is get, is get mechanical and, and manually try and override your natural swing path. 
um, for me, it, it's just, it's something I kind of like a couple of weeks ago, it kind of went off the rails a little bit and I've just been having a little trouble finding little, what I call it is the, the slot. There's a place that I know if I get into forehands automatic, it's there, right? And, and golfers call it the slot, right? When a golfer gets into the slot, it's like the swing is just this thing that's a byproduct of the coil, right? Not to get over technical here, but, um, if you can't find the slot, then, then you're going to be, you know, you're going to be off the rails a little bit. So for me, the process was simply recognizing it and, and it was all week. So it wasn't just a, this thing that happened in the finals. So all week I had to deal with this, this, this thing just not being where I would like it to be. And so the process just became do the work and do the work means hit my patterns, uh, create the openings. And a lot of times, instead of taking the first opening, I went back to the, to the source of the pattern. So I might go back to the guy's backhand instead of now that I pulled him out wide enough, uh, my tendency is to want to go bigger into that forehand side. And what I did was I managed to keep myself in check and not go big and just go, you know, let's, let's just, let's just throw another rally ball into the backhand side there. And then what inevitably happened is the fact that I just stayed calm and just stayed in the point that little extra. And I'm not talking about bunting the ball around the court. I wasn't just pushing and, and hoping the guy was going to miss. All I did was I found everybody's shot tolerance by me just staying patient and, and hitting another quality ball. It's not my, the finish ball. I mean, those matches could have been over quicker, <laughs> you know, if, if my, my, yeah. You know, my top forehand had showed up. Yeah, those matches would have been over quicker, without a doubt. But that's just not the nature of the beast. It's tournament tennis, and you have to deal with the variables of that moment, of that day that's happening right now. So for me, it was about playing the patterns and not being greedy about getting finishing. And so what I found was is I found everybody's shot tolerance. And it was like, I'm okay then. Because they, they, you know, get into the backhand. My backhand was fine. I could roll it. I could carve it. You know, slice is one of my best shots. Um, so I had no problem being patient in that role. And what I found was, is that, again, I found everybody's shot tolerance. I could, I could literally just stay in there as much as I wanted to go ahead and just, like, hit the dinger. Right. Yeah. Don't do it. And it's not that I didn't do it occasionally, you know, want to pull the trigger just to see if, is it there? <laughs> nope. Okay. <laughs> Let's go back. Still Let's not there yet. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, so, so that the workaround is, do you have the presence of mind to not first, not panic. And second, stick with your patterns, stick with what you still do well but instead of hitting that bigger finish, hit the correct shot, but let's temper it a little bit and go ahead and know that you're going to be in the point one or two extra hits, maybe, maybe three yeah. or four. Yeah. Well, um, look, I think a lot of players do uh, a couple of things. Number one is they miss a couple of shots. Let's, let's, let's stay in the forehand, for example. Yeah. So they miss a couple of the forehands that they normally make and they think, well, I've got to make up for this thing. Yeah, by going like the biggest forehand ever hint, maybe Rafa, you know, hit one a little bit, bit you know, a little bit bigger yesterday. But today, <laughs> I'm going to make up for all the ones that I've missed in this one shot, as right. if as if that's going to bring it back. And which I used to try that back in the day and had uh, zero zero success with that. <laughs> um, but the other thing too, Jeff is. I think players get into, and I see this in the warm up. I mean, I've heard about this in the warm up. Hey, man, I didn't feel my forehand in the warm up. Well, now it becomes an excuse. If I lose today, it's an excuse building story. Right. And really, every time I hear that from someone, you know, it's just like you said, well, you know, well, what's the workaround? I mean, there have been days when I've gone out to play a match and, and, my, and my top or forehand, for whatever reason, and I can't tell you what it is. But it's just not there. So I will slice and hack and short it, uh, chopping. I don't know. Absolutely. But I'll do whatever I have to do. And there have been times when all of a sudden, like, oh, that was the answer to this guy. 
Right. <laughs> By sliding a couple of underspin slice forehand returns right. down low, I'm winning points. <laughs> so, and of course, there's well, our favorite I mean, lefty, Rich Cranks, going with hit it harder, all caps. Yeah, it will come, come back. back. Okay. Well, that's. Yeah. Um, th that's, the, that's the thing. I mean, you know, I showed up in Vegas and my forehand didn't, you know, somehow along the way it, it jumped out of the car or got lost in my bag and I never, you know, it just. And so, you know, like you said, I mean, that the deal is, is, is there's more than one way to win a match and you, you can't be so, um, you can't be so, uh, stubborn in your process that this is the way I hit my forehand. This is the way, I, you know, da, 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 and then, and this is the way I win matches. And then, Oh, I don't like this type of opponent. And da, 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 cause you don't get to choose in a tournament league play. There's some shenanigans, right? You can manipulate the lineup and blah, blah, blah. And you can get, you know, and, and the court you get to play on. If you're at your home court, I list my favorite court. I, oh, it's a warm fuzzy, uh, blah, blah, blah. It's all great and dandy. Well, tournament, <laughs> listen, Tournament ain't that story. Tournament is, is you get who you get, right? And so Jeff, Jeff, here are the balls. You guys are back on court twenty-eight. Where's yeah. twenty-eight? Well, you have to drive over there. Yeah, yeah. Here comes the shuttle. Um, take <laughs> out there, and, you know. And oh, court twenty-eight is the only court that didn't get resurfaced this last year. Okay, thanks. Great. <laughs> So, <laughs> so everything else was resurfaced and this one wasn't. So now you're going to play a match there and then tomorrow you're going to play on one of the fresh courts and it's going to be four times slower, right? Or whatever, whatever it might be. Yeah. Which, which happens. Listen. And that could be a reason your forehand slightly off today. You know, it, it could be. So, so, you know, here's a phrase I learned from the legendary NorCal coach, Rich Anderson, when I first went to Kenyatta and played for him. Um, it's not, you know, it's really great when you're, when everything's firing on all 12 cylinders and you're just, you know, bing, it's just happening. I mean, those are fun days. I'm not putting that down. Listen, I love those days. It's just, it's, you feel like a God. It's, it's wonderful. However, the rubber meets the road is, is it's not whether you can win when you're playing well, it's, can you figure out a way to win when you're not? I've got, I mean, so this last week was, was pretty satisfying to me because what I discovered is my baseline level of play right now is pretty high. Just, just my baseline level of play, not without, without going big with all, all that stuff. And luckily I had the presence of mind to simply do the work. And it's, and, you know, we call that journeyman tennis and journeyman tennis is having the foundational truths of a forehand. I don't care what style of forehand you're hitting, but the foundational truths of a forehand, the foundational truths of a backhand, the foundations of a, of a forehand volley, a backhand volley, a serve, the things that allow you to put the ball in the court and to create and actually execute patterns. I don't need, and this is another part, we're going to get into this a little bit later. I don't need the 17 different volleys to master the 17 different volleys. I don't need to master the eight different backhands. You've got to be freaking kidding me. <laughs> On any given day, you better be able to get one. Have one that works. Because if you have one that works, you can execute a pattern. So you're saying that if you only on that day have a slice backhand, there's no way you can you can win that match? Okay, here, here's the reality of it. The guy who played in the finals basically sliced every backhand. He was in the finals. Yeah. Uh, who's our, our, our good friend Mark Vines last year at the 60s National Grass Court Gold Ball event. Beats Federley in straights, like crushed him in the final, like two and one or two and two. In the semis, he played and we interviewed him. And I made the comment, I said, you know, Mark, uh, um, this is for our, for our players out there, you know, it look, it looked like, uh, you know, you only hit maybe three, you only came over three backhands during the match. <laughs> and he corrected me and said, mm, no, I didn't. I actually, I, I think I maybe picked out a bigger number. And he said, no, I think I only came over three. 
in a, in a two set his semifinal match before he got to the finals. And this is a this is a you know the top sixty year old in the country now. And so the idea is that is that with with the menu that broad, <laughs> you're going to be distracted by what to do. You've got to narrow your focus and and narrow your choices to what do I have in my toolkit? What are my basics that I can get to, that I can reach in, get a hold of? It feels familiar to me. I'm confident with this tool. And now can I apply it? You know, okay, today, okay, I'm not going to be building the Taj Mahal. Today it's going to be a, an outhouse out in the back, a shack, but it's going to be a really nice outhouse. And I'm going to end up with the wind. <laughs> Well, it's, that's true. I hope, you know, I mean, I, I hope this is making sense to everybody because it's just it, – it, it's a, it, there's nothing – like I can't give you this like, oh, X, Y, Z. The X, Y, Z, the formula is first you have the presence of mind to understand what the heck is going on. Two, can you still play your patterns with, with what you have now, right? And three, can you keep yourself in check? not to get greedy. Yeah. Look, I mean, if you can do those things right there, the chances go way up that whatever shot is sort of AWOL is going to come back. I remember yeah. um, I played uh, doubles with the great Hugh Thompson. We played the world's individuals in 2009, Perth, Australia. You know, we're in the semis. And I'm coming in and this guy is, is just taking my serve and, and, creating some havoc for me on my transitional shot. And I missed a couple of a couple of transitional volleys. And I just kind of, you know, I kind of gave it that thing. And, and Hugh says to me, just trust it, just overly trust it. And I said, well, he said, no, nah, don't go there. <laughs> just <laughs> trust it. Think about the statement. Just right. trust it. <laughs> We're trying and, to the statement, right. And that, and that was all that I really needed. And, and from there, it was like, um, you know, I'd sort of mentally was taking myself out of, out of it. And he just kind of brought me in. He didn't say anything more than just, he didn't say, look, how many, have you hit 20 million transitional volleys in your life? Yes. <laughs> All right. Have you made most of them? Yes. Then trust it. So um, I, I guess the point that I, I, I think part of the workaround, Jeff, is that as you said, yeah, you gotta you gotta recognize that this is happening. Don't panic and don't think that that because it's slightly a wall that you that you have to force it back into action. Yeah. You don't want to do that. In fact, and and I, you know, Jeff's not saying you gotta go from a heavy windshield wiper topper forehand to a complete nutter hack slice. It, it, it could be just a slightly different version of what you're doing, right. but whatever it is, you have to trust that it's okay to do that. And the more you trust it, the chances go up that it's going to come back. There's no guarantee, no yep. guarantee. It's coming back on that day. Like Jeff has been saying, it's basically been somewhere else for a while. Yeah. And all you can do is just kind of go out there and in between tournaments or whatever right. just go ahead and hit a few dozen more of them and just don't just don't yeah. force I mean, it in the warm-ups it, it felt like i was uh flirting with it like okay it's i know it's in around there because I'm, I'm feeling it come off the strings and it feels like it's uh okay maybe <laughs> you know and you know i and so normally in my pattern work uh, you know i'll 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 two to three times beat somebody senseless into a corner and then, and then snap something over to the other side. And the, and what was happening is I would go one, and each time you're, you know, you're in the progression of hitting a pattern, you're kind of escalating, um, and be, and normally because you hit one forehand at this, and then the next forehand you up the ante a little bit, but that forehand is also giving you rhythm. It's giving you timing. You're getting the, the feel of it. You're grooving it a little bit. And usually by the third one, it's like, yeah, all everything, all all systems go. And what was happening to me is I get to the third one and I would literally, this is no joke, I'd literally hit the ball four feet wide. I mean, completely off the rails. And it was, I would just stand there and kind of go, 
<laughs> hmm. All right. <laughs> I mean, I, I couldn't even get upset about it really because it was just so obscure. It was yeah. just so off the rails. And I just went, okay, so I kind of, you know, Brenny, for you, you know, I'd hit and then I'd take that third one sometimes now and I'd kind of hit a carve with it, a little inside out carve. Um, definitely lower pace. But now the guy's got something else to look at. I'm attacking a different part of his strike zone. And, you know, and then I ended up with something else to work with. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, look, um, you mentioned Mark Vines. And when we talked to him, he also said something else that, um, that, that for me, is, is that my phone going off? That or me. Okay. That me. Um, so I played Atlanta Senior Invitational four years ago. And uh, I'm playing a guy, Al Yearwood, actually, I don't know, second or third round. Good, good player. Yeah. And uh, we're in the clay and I'm not an, you know, I haven't played a lot of clay core tennis. So, and this is one of my first, you know, big time national clay court events. So I'm out there and I'm still got the California. I can see my reflection on the court kind of, you know, <laughs> hardcore thing going. I'm right. just looking at every ball as a, you know, as a, as a put away opportunity. And I, all of a sudden I'm down, I don't know, four, two or four, one. And I just started thinking to myself and, and Mark Vines said this to us when we interviewed him, I said, Brent, you cannot do anything until you've touched the ball three times. And I started, I started counting. Right. And I just started counting and it could be the serve one. Yeah. And the ball that came back two. And it went three. And uh, oh, okay. I won the point. All right. Here we go. All right. <laughs> One. Uh, oh, I won the point. Okay. So I think that's another way of kind of working around when something is off in your game is rather than trying to fix it, is yeah. just start counting. Just start counting off shots. And that's something that Mark said. You know, we asked him about his strategies. Well, you know, what do you do here? Well, I, I play more serve and volley. Well, what do you do against this guy? I play more back, you know, more baseline thing. And I start kind of, and then, and what if, I think we said, well, what's, you know, what's plan L? Right. And, and he says, I just count. Yeah. I just count. And, and most of the time, you know, you maybe get to four, maybe, yeah. and that's it. And, and what you and what you discover with the workaround is that, wait a minute, I don't need this big monster windshield wiper, 17 different types of forehand nuances to be able to compete. Yeah. Just need, yeah. It, it really, and the other thing about counting that's, that's really interesting that, that works so well <laughs> is that it, um, it elevates your focus to just present tense things. You're, you're no longer now searching in, in your head for how to hit your forehand or how to hit your slice backhand or how to, how to, how to, how to, how to. And, and you get down to just being in the moment, present tense, do that. Okay. Get ready. And then and you, everything kind of elevates in that scenario because, because now you're focused on the ball. There's one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here comes another one. There's two. Okay. Yeah. And you kind of, everything elevates a little bit. And that's really, right. you know, the natural state we'd like to be in is in that elevated state of focus, elevated state of recovery and, and ready position and prep and, uh, and footwork. Right. I mean, and all those things, if, when you count elevate, even though you're not still focusing on them individually, and this is where, where you kind of move yourself. <clears throat> and again, not to get overly ethereal here, but it is moving yourself into an athletic state as opposed to a micromanaging state of trying to figure out how to fix your forehand. Right. And if you right. can move yourself into that athletic state and respond that way, you'll find um, one, your stress levels will reduce. You won't be as you know hyper focused on the negative and you can actually get some work done and actually win matches um, with, like without a doubt. What do we got, Joe? Uh, yeah, yeah, Joe. I, I I know Joe. Good guy, nice player. Um, and he's he's saying that you know his backhand. He just feels way more confident <clears throat> on his on his backhand. And so, and he hits eighty percent backhands. And so, what I would say is that number one, if you're hitting eighty percent backhands, that um, it's got to mean that you're running around some forehands to avoid that to be able to 
hit some backhands. And, you know, in the end, I was coaching a guy the other day who, who wants to hide his backhand. He wants to do the opposite. Right. And he said, but gosh, I'm getting really tired, you know, at the end of my matches. <laughs> I said, well, I am imagining that you're performing twice as much footwork as your opponent. Right. So the key would be let's get a, a backhand or in Joe's case, let's get a forehand that is serviceable enough that you feel confident that you can keep the thing in play and that you don't feel look, I, I you know, as we've been talking about this, Jeff, especially with the forehand, I'm just wondering, I'm thinking with all the hype out there, whether it's yeah, we, on, online yeah. stuff, whatever it is, that, that, that there's this, there's this message with the hype. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. We kind of lost, we're losing you there a little bit. Brandy, your feet is a little choppy. Okay. Um, am I back? Not Almost. Really. No, no okay. I got a, I got a frozen picture right now. I got it. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and keep talking, but I, I kind of think that there's this hype and the message is, is you have to have a big forehand. And if you don't have a big forehand that you can't compete. And uh, so I think when, I think when, um, let's see, does this help Jeff? Does this help at all? No, uh, no. still choppy. Is, is, is my in the back room uh, on, on the other? <laughs> no, up some. no, she's, she's out playing pickable. No. Um, all right. Well, listen, guys, until we kind of get the stream. Right, so I'm going I'm to jump in here then. Hopefully, can you hear me, Brent? Am I clear for you? I can hear you. Okay. Everybody's saying loud and clear here. Maybe it's, maybe it's on my feed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump in here, though, on that, on on John's uh, comment there, too, as well. And that is, or Joe, rather, um, it's really common um, that guys will make more mistakes off their forehand side than the backhand side. And literally because because we'll take higher risk. Um, and so, you know, part of it, Joe, is tone down. Are, are you aware of whether or not you're escalating emotionally? when you've done the right pattern and now you feel like you have the opening, are you trying to hurry up to hit the ball into the open court? And that's a really common, common, common mistake is that you've done all this front work, the pre-work, right? You've, you've, you've set it up perfectly. And this is what we call, we call in the game that uh, the guy doesn't finish very well. And so it's really common for a lot of players, um, Joe, that, that you set the point up perfectly and now you see you've got the opening and now all of a sudden you, you change your mental state and you're thinking, okay, now I, need to, now I need to finish it, right? But the problem with that is that you, you escalate emotionally and you're going to throw your timing off and you can, you can hurry up and hit the ball wide. You can hurry up and hit the ball long. Um, because now you've changed your focus for to not wanting your opponent to touch the ball. You can't care whether your opponent touches the ball or not. <laughs> I know that sound that even sounds probably counterintuitive to a lot of people, but you just can't care. So in my case in Vegas, I that I was just that that concept was just in full force. I just didn't care whether they touched the ball or not. I just kept working. And so, so Joe, I'd, I'd say, you know, be aware of that when you're playing, you know, play a practice set and just the, the constraint would be you don't get to hit a winner. Just keep playing your patterns and see what happens at the end of the point. Play a whole set that way. And again, everybody who's listening today, if you can play practice sets with constraints, meaning I'm going to play this whole set and and not hit a winner i'm just going to play my patterns and just see what happens and if you lose 6-0 who cares um so um so as you do that or or it might be you know uh another constraint is every time whoever gets to 41st in every game the next point uh, so if it's 40-15, if I'm serving and it's 40-15, if I lose that next point, I go back to love. My opponent keeps his 15, so now I'm going to serve from the ad side at love 15. 
hope everybody hope that makes sense to everybody. Or if I'm serving at 40, 30 and I lose that point, I go back to love. I now start serving at love 30. You've got to put some things in place that force you to deal with pressure over, 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 over again. And so that's a way to do that. And it's also a way to kind of help curb your desire to not want to lose a set 6-0. But for me, literally, I can do it. I can mentally put myself in the right state of what am I working on? And I don't, the, the set number, the number, the score at the end of the set is irrelevant to me when it's practice, when I'm working on a pattern or I'm working on, on this, Joe, uh, if I'm, you know, trying not to hit winners, I'm just trying to just pattern, 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 whatever it might be. You've got to be able to move yourself into that place emotionally that you just don't give a crap because guess what? It, it doesn't matter. It's not, it's not a match. It's not a league match. It's a practice set. And that's what, let's put the phrase practice set in the proper quotes going out and practicing with your team and playing three sets on a Thursday night is not practice. That's playing sets, which is fine. And that's good. I got nothing against that. <laughs> I played some fun sets this weekend with Brenny <laughs> down in the desert. I wouldn't call it practice though. I mean, that's the reality, yeah. right? Yeah. So get, get, get disciplined about what you're calling practice and what it is you're calling just playing. Yeah. So I would tell Joe, uh, he actually ironically mentioned something in his earlier comment about uh, being a right-handed thrower and a left-handed baseball hitter. I was the same way. And, and I think maybe that's why my backhand just feels a little bit better. But I would tell you, Joe, that my forehand is average at best. Average. It is not – it is, in fact, my return to serve frequently – is a low flyer. I mean, it's kind of a slice. And I'm happy to do that because I feel I've got so much better control about where the ball lands, stays down low. as a, And I just, it's so much more efficient. I mean, it just, in terms of energy, I'm just not beating myself up. So um, I, would, I would tell you that to, if you want to, you know, if, if you, if, if you're thinking, and if anyone's thinking that you've got to go heavy with a forehand, and, and I, the thing I was saying, Jeff, before when I was my feed was choppy or yours was, is that is I think there's this messaging out there online from tennis pros, from what we see on the, on, on the tennis channel, which is you've got to have a heavy forehand if you're going to be competitive. Right. <laughs> it's just like... The biggest bunch of sh uh, yeah, stuff. What's the, little, what's the emoji? The little pile. Yeah, <laughs> it just. I mean, it's just. It's just doing a disservice to the game. Completely. And, and oh, so I'm just reading Joe's comment here, and uh, so he says, Jeff, I'm not trying to rush the forehand to finish the point. Okay, so that's good, Joe. The other thing I would tr say, Joe, if, is if you have, if you can slide a forehand, a slight slice is that the other thing you want to do is that everybody, you know, I, it's, it's akin to baseball and a pitcher in baseball and the batter, right? There's a strike zone and the pitcher knows way ahead of time what the batter likes, what he doesn't like. In tennis, we don't always have that information. We have to figure it out as we go along. And so being able to do something else other than hit your high rolling forehand, being able to slide something in there low in a way that might be able to touch another part of the guy's strike zone on his backhand. We, we, we have to be able to hit different marks to be able to, to find what, what pattern works. And when I'm in that pattern, you know, when I slide this, they tend to give me this every time. It's not about, you know, pattern work is not about, oh, when I do this, they miss it on this ball every time. That's not what it does. What you're doing is what parts of the pattern, when I do this and when I put the ball in this part of his strike zone, he gives me this almost every time. Once I have this feedback that says they're going to give me this ball every time, now I've got some secret information. Now I have, I have a little bit, we call it the keys to the kingdom. I don't have to fear what they're doing because I know when I do this, they're going to give me this. I do this, they give me this. And so you have to be able to put some balls in different parts of their strike zone to be able to flush out a little bit more opportunity. So Joe, I would, I would give that some thought too. 
Yeah. Look, um, I think another way to make a standard, and this is what I do with my forehand to make my forehand a little bit better, because I will tell you it is average at best, um, is learn how to play a forehand drop shot. And the reason for that is because once they they have to they have to cover the possibility of you dropping playing a dropper off your forehand, now they start to play a little bit closer, if not on top of the baseline, maybe a foot or two inside the baseline. And now that standard forehand rally ball is much tougher just simply because of where you're forcing them to have to have to play. And, and I think one of the things I still think that the, that the drop shot is, is so underutilized. Yeah. Uh, in terms of in terms of that kind of strategy, how do I move my opponent to play closer in, even though they're right. not coming in? But the next time, and it look obviously you've got to have a disguise setup, right? It can't it can't be two different setups. It's 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 got to look the same because once they're inside that baseline looking for the possibility of a drop shot, and you just kind of float one deep, now all of a sudden, now all of a sudden it's just much tougher for them. Right. Just just because of where you've kind of moved them. So, yeah, um, um, I'm going to I'm going to circle back here too to, you know, the work around here. Uh, what happened in Vegas for me as well was um, I, I put a lot of emphasis and focus on my return game. And um, that proved to be priceless in winning those matches is I, I just focused totally on making every return. Um, I know in the semifinal match, uh, we finished and my opponent said, you, you wore me out on my serve because just about every service game, I was up love 30, right? So he was the, my opponent was serving at love 30 almost every service game he, he served. And so that just, just wear and tear, wear and tear, wear and tear, and putting that kind of pressure on your opponent. So the return to serve game became – kind of my avenue for, for creating uh, that extra pressure um, uh, without having, you know, the big forehand available. What I found is that I found another avenue to, to completely, completely put pressure on. And so um, I made a point of my little mantra in my head was make the return, win the point. I just, I associated those two things together, make the return, win the point, make the return, win the point. And so it didn't happen every time, but, even if I lost the point, it wasn't because I missed the return. I made the guy touch the ball. And I started, and then I started to get confident, you know, my confidence um, rose is that as I played those, you know, the quarter semis and finals. And so the second serve, I made my opponents pay for having to hit a second serve. And so that's another quality that um, in terms of having a workaround when things aren't going perfect, <laughs> is have you worked on your, on your return game because the second serve is is a place where you can just inflict just a just a ton of pain without hitting winners, just making the guy feel like he's under the gun every time he's in. So that you know, I ended up getting uh, quite a few double faults in the process because they 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 were trying to, you know, one they tried to hit their first serve bigger, and then two they tried to hit the second serve bigger. And, and, and both failed then, you know, the, it puts them in that kind of this, this bad rut. Um, so I wanted to mention that, that that was a big part of winning that, uh, winning that tournament was the return to serve uh, game as well. I've got three minutes and then I got to scoot. <clears throat> okay. Can I, I have, gonna, a, I have a, I have a date on the grass court here. Oh God, I'm sorry. To hear. Sorry. All right. So I'm just going to run down a little list here. Let me, let me do this real quick. Let me answer Joe's. Um, okay. Why is the forehand dropper more difficult to execute? So without, Joe, without knowing exactly what your standard prep is on your forehand, uh, you know, my prep is such that I, I don't go big, heavy windshield wiper, semi to full Western forehand grip. That's not my standard forehand. And, and, and if it is, if you're, if you're getting around on the grip at all, if, if you're really kind of setting up for that kind of a thing, I could see why it would be tough to be able to disguise a forehand, a forehand dropper. So the first thing I would tell you is obviously the setup has to look the same. Maybe all you need to do is to hit about 6,281 in <laughs> practice. 
I don't know. Maybe that's the. Maybe I, that's I think the, you know. I here's here's the. I mean, for me, the biggest key on on using the dropper is setting it up correctly. Meaning, has have I created space between my opponent and the net? Right? Have yeah. I have I pushed them back behind the baseline before I right. execute? The farther back behind the baseline I can push them, the less the less perfect my dropper has to be. I don't hit my dropper also. I don't hit it with the intent that it's going to be a winner. I'm okay with the guy running 40 feet and using up fuel and burning his fuel, even if he gets it. Even if he comes up with an ESPN winner, I'm okay with that because the guy just, he's breathing heavy now, and now he's going to go back and serve. I like that situation personally because now he may just give me two easy, you know, bonehead errors you know, uh, off of it because now he's, he's winded. Right. And so for me, um, that just, just hitting, you know, it's, it's almost like not even a drop shot. It's just, it's just as, it's just a soft, short ball. Just start with that. I would say, Joe, start with that on your forehand side, push the guy. If he's righty, push the guy wide on his forehand and just hit a short, soft ball to the ad side and just start to tinker with it and, and, you know, and, and see how that works. Well, look, and, 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 and if you find his big weapon, let, let's say it's a forehand that Jeff suggested, pull him wide with that forehand and kind of hope he gives you a lot of pace Yeah, because now you've got the ball, you can play your dropper. It doesn't take a ton of disguise at that moment. Mm -mm. And he's, he's, he's hung out in the right. lower 40 trying to scramble back. And, you know, what's going to happen the next point when you win that is next time you take him out wide, he's going to hit it even bigger. Right. Because most guys don't realize, oh, wait a minute, this guy's I'm got a drop good. shot. Maybe I should buy some time to come back. Yeah. I don't know. They get they, they want to get the ball to you too fast. <laughs> and, and you have to be OK with like, that's exactly what I want the guy to do. Right. Jeff, you, know? you we we got 60 seconds. What's uh, what's All your right. what's your list got here? Here's my list. Here's my listing rant. I didn't actually go heavy rant today, but uh, we'll get to that. But uh, these are just headlines, okay? Three times power serve system, super lag and snap. Good for oh. your serve. Game changer power tip. It's easy to do. The number one power leak. How to attack consistently without making lots of errors. Boy, wouldn't that be a miracle? My favorite <laughs> backhand tip. I can tell you this, everybody, listen. Federer doesn't fix his backhand or make improve his backhand with a tip from Lubicic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> doesn't happen that way. Oh, how to, uh, how to become a four or five player. God, that's a mystery. And I'll say this on that, on that one, I'll take a four or five tournament player over a four or five league player every day of the week in that matchup same same rating but i'll take the tournament player over the league player every day of the week master the eight different types of backhands now if that doesn't throw a wrench in the works when your backhand goes off the rails which one did they all go <laughs> um world-class backhand Crushing the on-the-rise backhand. Uh, how to compete at tennis. How do I stop choking? Why do I play worse in matches? And this one, this is the last one here is the one, is the one that I just thought. Inside the mind of Federer. How arrogant do you have to be? <laughs> so, to even attempt. <laughs> to think you know. You think even if he's giving an interview and tells you what's going on inside his mind. Really? <laughs> I mean, give me a stinking break. Okay. So one, I'm just going to, the, my, my disclaimer here is like, I know, I know some of you guys, you know, it's great. Okay. I don't have anything against the guys who are out there working. They're doing their courses, they're promoting them and they're selling them and blah, blah, blah. And I look at them. And you know what? A lot of it, there's a lot of good basic information there. But the reality is this. If you can't fundamentally do these four things, ready position, a check, a, a split check ready position when my opponent hits the ball, 
early preparation of your framework of the stroke you want to use. Footwork that follows. Good, established, active footwork. And then number four, a stable platform to hit from. If you can do those four things, you don't need 17 volleys. You don't need eight backhands. Those are the four fundamentals. If you can discipline yourself to focus on those four things, everything that you do on the tennis court will improve, like without a doubt. Um, so you're saying that the uh, the recently dearly departed Larry Turville, who had one basic serve, yeah, had one basic forehand, had only a slice backhand, and the volley was basically the biggest no-brainer in the history of no-brainers because he came in on balls where the guy was so stretched out, the volley was literally a bunt to the open court. Right. So it wasn't, it had, it had hardly any technique. It was just, oh, okay. So, All I have to do is put it in the, anyway. so, so you're telling me. that. So if, wait, a minute, wait a minute. My question is then, how many basic gold balls did Larry have? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, how many world titles did he have? How many right? gold balls? And, Look, so, and if you look at all the guys, if you look at the Jimmy Parkers, if you look at all these guys, you look at the Dick Johnsons, these guys, nothing fancy, nothing fancy. They had mastered what Jeff just talked about. They'd mastered those four things. And when you can master those four things, shot choice, court positioning, you learn through experience. You just, and you have to put yourself out there. You have to, you have to, you can't do the comfy confines of your home club. Yeah. Uh, court three, court four in front of the clubhouse. Everyone gets to watch you play against the same guy that you beat every week, two and two. Right. <laughs> uh, you, if, yeah. if you really, if you really honest to God want to become a better tennis player, then enter a freaking tournament. Tournament play. Just go enter an age group tournament and no, they don't, they don't segregate, they don't organize you guys by skill level. You might enter a tournament and pay your 60 bucks to enter. And you might, you might get the number one seed in the first, in the first round. And you know what happens is a lot of guys go, well, I'll just get embarrassed. Well, if that's your, if that's your attitude, then, then don't enter the tournament. But if you want to discover what those guys know that you don't know, you don't know, and eight different backhands and 17 different volleys, it ain't the answer, guys. It's not the answer. Nope. So master the fundamentals, just like Jeff said. Put your butt out there in a tournament, a senior tournament, age group, and, and find out where you're at. Find out exactly where you're at. And, and, yeah, less buck right there. And find out where you're at, and you'll start to realize, okay, when I go home, here's really what I have to work on. I don't have to work on volley number 12. Right. I have to I have to really master volley number one. One. Which is we call we call that journeyman tennis. Journeyman tennis will win you more matches than than volley number 15. Journeyman tennis is if you're serving and volleying is I make the first serve, I come in and I grind, spit, kick, shove, cut in line, whatever it takes to make my first volley. That's called journeyman ball. And by making your first volley, you've created pressure on your opponent. You, you, you just, it's a different mindset to really um, cross over that threshold when you can move into that thing where it just says, I just don't care if the other guy hits the ball. Well, look, that was the whole, the, you know, today's topic, which is my forehands AWOL. Um, what's, what's the workaround? Well, the workaround is, is going back to the real basic fundamentals. And, and what's, what, what, I mean, in Jeff's case, <clears throat> look, I mean, when his goes AWOL, it's slightly AWOL. If yours is going super AWOL, then that just means you haven't worked on the fundamentals enough, and that's okay. 
you're being probably inundated with, well, you got to have eight different backhands and 17 different volleys. And let me get you inside the, you know, inside the mind of fed. Right. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Just stop it. I mean, focus on the four things I said. I yeah. do. That, yeah. That's what I go out to the court and I go, okay, let's, let's elevate these things. Let's get these things going. And that's, that's what puts every day. You've got to find out where you're at and what's, you know, and every day though, are you doing work every day? Are you doing, I call it maintenance work. If you're playing three times a week, you're doing maintenance work. If you want to get better, you got to hit four or five and, the, and, and not just playing. You have to be working on things in the mix there, playing plus an hour of, you know, ball machine. And all I'm going to do on the ball machine is, is prep, adjust my feet, stop and hit from a stable platform. Can I stay there and hit? Okay, now I'm going to go back and get ready again and do it again. Lather, rinse, repeat. The wisdom of the shampoo bottle. <laughs> I, I really, I've, I've texted Owen and told him I'm running a few minutes late, but I got to scoot. <laughs> tell, Owen, tell Owen to be ready next time for my around the back volley because he wasn't ready for that last weekend. That's true. That yeah, really, that really upset him. It did. That, that definitely upset him. All right, guys, listen. Thanks for hanging out with us today. This has been a lot of fun. Um, you know, I repeat the four fundamentals. Yeah, okay. Let's go. Let's go real quick. Number one, ready position. And that's an active ready position, meaning you've, you've split checked when just, just as your opponents are making contact with the ball. That means ready position, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Two, preparing your framework. Framework is the position we get into to, to use our forehand or backhand or volley, whatever that is. So some, some pros call it a unit turn. Whatever that might be, I call it preparing the framework of the stroke you want to use. Okay. Then footwork, taking that framework and moving it over to where the ball is. For stable platform, the act of hitting a tennis ball shouldn't cause you to lose your balance. So you should be able to strike the ball and finish on your feet the way you started um, the stroke. Hope that makes sense. Um, and literally, come on out and see us in California. I got a private court in Lafayette. Let's do some work face to face. Let's do some work, and we'll get you. We'll 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 get you on the path. And um, I think uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post. Can I post your uh, your email here? Yeah. What are we doing, Jeff? At uh... Jacklitz three sixty five. Okay. Dot com. Dot com. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, Brenny and I are tinkering with doing another uh, little workshop in the desert uh, before the Wilson, right? We're talking about that? Yeah. Yeah. So. So two things. Uh, if you're in on the West Coast, you want to get together with Jeff on the court, get some private work done, go over those four things, kind of discover what is your, what is your, um, what are those four things? I mean, because they're all sort of unique to everybody. Everyone sort of right. has a different little you know, set up position, everyone's a little different footwork pattern. That's fine. But you need to find out what they are and then you need to go master them. So if you're in, especially if you're in Northern California, uh, get in touch with Jeff, Jeff at jacklets365.com. And then um, if you've got some interest, Jeff and I are going to do a uh, another one day, maybe two day workshop in the desert in January, as we did last year. And if you've got some interest in that, uh, you can you can hit me up uh, over at Facebook or YouTube or my email address is brent at webtennis.com or you've got Jeff's email there too as well. Um, and we'd love to get together with you. All right, guys. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Jeff, as always, hysterical. <laughs> hysterical. We, do, we need to do more, I think, more. More ranting. More ranting, more throwing rocks and that kind of stuff. <laughs> All right, guys. All right, everybody. Dan, good to talk to you. See you guys later. Thanks.